Um, so, intro, quick intro to myself. Tarek already talked about, you know, I work at Google, worked on a few different teams there, um, and did a bunch of sales engineering and programming uh, in my previous job before that. So, uh, even though I've been in sort of in management for the last nine years, I still code every now and then, still write some tools for my team, and uh, write, some, write some tools for, for Google. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, privacy and fungibility, sort of the background of why I think these things are important. Uh, and then I'll go into the specifics of how CoinJoin and CoinShuffle work. Um, I don't know how many people here uh, know how those work. Does, has anybody, uh, I guess, first let me ask, how many people here have heard of CoinJoin before? Okay, that's good. Um, how many people have heard of CoinShuffle? Okay, a few. Oh, that's actually more than I thought, so uh, not bad. Uh, and then I'll do a little demo of what I've written. Uh, I've used this really snazzy wallet that I found. Uh, <laughs> called the uh, SF Devs uh, HD wallet, uh, which I've altered a little bit for CoinShuffle. Uh, and then we'll talk you know, about a few other things here and there. Is it open source? It is open source. It's not. If you go to github.com slash bribe slash bitcoin.js with wallet, uh, you'll find the wallet there. Uh, there's a couple of other components. There's a server component that's also um, on my GitHub, which I'll show links to later. Um, one of the reasons this, this topic was interesting to me is I started uh, getting interested in Bitcoin in 2011. Uh, Mike Kern, who many of you guys might know, uh, was a Google engineer. Uh, and he uh, sold me my first Bitcoins back then. Uh, which went to like 30, 32, went from eight dollars to thirty-two dollars, and I thought, wow, this is you know amazing. I'm gonna be a millionaire. Uh, but then it crashed to like one dollar, uh, and I completely forgot about Bitcoin for about a year, uh, while it slowly you know uh, uh, kind of came back up to like ten bucks. But one of the things that Mike uh, actually posted to our internal mailing list was he didn't think that Bitcoin was going to be ready for the mainstream in the near future. This is back in like two thousand eleven or two thousand twelve, because of this transaction linkability problem. Uh, and what this is, is that when, if, if you buy a cup of coffee, something as simple as a cup of coffee for me, I can take your transaction history and trace it back to all of your previous transactions. If, if, if you're a naive user, if you haven't done anything to try and, uh, and cover your tracks. So for example, I can easily go back and see your paycheck. I can see, you know, look for large incoming transactions that happen every two weeks. Um, I can also see, you know, maybe you've been gambling on Satoshi Dice, I can see that. Uh, if you donate to the Pirate Bay, I can see that kind of thing. If you get any big purchases, like a wedding ring or a car, um, I can just kind of guess and see like how much you spent on all those things. So um, one of the things that I think is, I think Mike is fairly right about the, um, for the mainstream user, once they find out that their neighbors or their friends or their family members can kind of uncover their financial tracks, um, I think Bitcoin becomes a lot scarier for them. Uh, than, than the existing financial system. So, um, so yeah, like a typical user is is likely to un inadvertently reveal their entire transaction history. So, uh, there's a couple of technologies that, that. So, I've actually sort of been interested in this problem for a while because I feel like without some sort of solution here, um, it's going to be hard for Bitcoin to go mainstream. Um, the next uh, sort of a piece of this uh, next property, I think, that Bitcoin does not really actually have is uh, fungibility. So I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen many of the presentations about uh, the properties of money, scarcity, scarcity durability, portability, invisibility, um, and then fungibility is kind of the weirdest word in there. But fungibility is, is the one thing where Bitcoin does not surpass the existing um, uh, monetary options. So. Fungibility, for those of you guys who don't know the term, basically means that uh, you can substitute any two things for each other. So in the case of like an ounce of gold, an ounce of, one ounce of gold can be traded for, is, is indistinguishable from another ounce of gold. And so they can be traded essentially equally. Um, and US dollars for the most part, I mean there's serial numbers and those kinds of things, but usually for the most part people aren't tracking those serial numbers. So any US dollar is good, as good for any transaction as any other US dollar. Uh, whereas Bitcoin, the, uh, the coins are not actually as fungible and not as substitutable, and, and they're very distinguishable from each other because you can view their entire history. And in the case of, you know, the obvious cases of like Silk Road or Mt. Gox, people track those coins. Uh, and some people might, might say at some point, hey, I'm not willing to accept a Silk Road coin or I'm not willing to accept a Mt. Gox coin. Uh, and if that were to happen, I'm sure you guys have, uh, many of you guys have probably heard about various proposals for taint and all those kinds of things. In that case, you have a situation where um, where people have to uh, sort of 
discount different coins. So a Bitcoin is not, not all Bitcoins are worth the same. One Bitcoin might be worth, you know, 0.95 Bitcoins if there are certain people who won't accept it. And once you start going down that road, you have this additional friction uh, every time you want to do a transaction because you need to check this database and make sure that your coin is, is, um, uh, is pure and you need to make sure that the people that you're going to buy stuff from will also accept your coin. So it just makes the whole um, Bitcoin economy, it just adds a little more friction to the whole Bitcoin economy. And uh, so I'm hoping that the Bitcoin, uh, I think that to be mainstream, Bitcoin needs to just not have any additional friction or it needs to eliminate that, that kind of friction as much as possible. Um, so talk a little bit about coin join. So that's the background. Um, any questions on those concepts? Um, so uh, talk a little bit about coin join and coin shuffle, which are two um, technology or two ideas for improving both the privacy and the fungibility of Bitcoin. Um, the basic way that it works is that um, instead of having on the left, or actually, sorry, I'm, I'm right now, <laughs> you're right, uh, the, uh, a normal transaction has, it's very easy to draw the link between the sender and the receiver of the transaction. So you know the transaction A is between these two people, transaction B is between these people, transaction C is between these two people. If in a coin join, uh, what happens is the inputs and outputs from those three transactions are combined into one big transaction, and uh, you don't know to which person any of the inputs is getting sent uh, eventually. So, um, oh yeah, this is pro proposed by Greg Maxwell, who was here a couple weeks ago. Thankfully, he's not here today. Otherwise, uh, I'm sure he'd have lots of uh, additional things to say about CoinJoin. But uh, this is so. The idea is that just by looking at the blockchain, you can no longer like look back and see, you know, what was somebody's salary? You know, did they spend money on Satoshi dice? You can see a whole bunch of people. Like in in a normal situation, you probably have 10, 20, potentially fifty people in these coin joins. So you would, it would be very hard for you to draw that linkage between any particular. Um, uh, output and, and the input that, that came before. So um, the steps to do a coin join. So I'll talk a little about coin join, which is a sort of like a more basic version, then I'll talk a little bit about coin shuffle. So in coin join, it's pretty simple. Everybody who wants to do a transaction at any particular time, they take their inputs, they take their outputs, they send them, everybody sends, let's say there's let's say the group of you know 50 of us all send our all want to do a coin join together. We all send all of our inputs and outputs to Tarek. Tarek then organizes the, uh, the coin join, and he says, here's my unsigned coin join. And it has all the inputs and all the outputs from all of us. All of us then review Tarek's coin join, and then we sign our inputs individually um, to make sure that uh, everything is as we're expecting. And the advantage of that is that, uh, the, advantage, the primary advantage of that is that the facilitator of the coin join has no ability to steal the coins. In order for the coins to transact, um, they still need to be signed by every uh, user. And Tarek actually has no, in this case, Tarek would have no private keys. This is opposed to kind of the previous technology where the, the, mix, the mixers, where it's basically a 100% trust model. You send your coins to a mixer, they can they do a bunch of transactions, and uh, but they have all the keys. And if they want to, they can run off and, and steal your money. Um, the downside, the one downside of coin join, though, is that the facilitator still knows the mapping between the inputs and outputs. So, um, so in this case, let's say um, we want to do a coin join, and uh, Tech was our facilitator. Tech on the blockchain itself, there would be no. Uh, it would be impossible, or it would be there's no uh, deterministic linkage between inputs and outputs. But Tech would actually have a uh, would have a, a would have knowledge of all the inputs and outputs. And he could re recreate that, or if he kept logs, um, those could be found and uh, you know basically used to delink the transactions. Uh, and uh, as I said, oh yeah, I guess uh, SharePoint and Dark Wallet are the most well-known uh, implementations of CoinJoin. And um, CoinShuffle actually takes that property, uh, which is that the, the facilitator knows the inputs and outputs and makes it so that nobody knows the inputs and outputs, and so it's it's more of a decentralized. Way to organize a coin join. So how, how well implemented are shared coin and dark wallet in your opinion? Um, so 
I don't know a lot about them. I think that Dark Wallet, um, is, my understanding is it's only two people coin joining at each coin join, which I think is not ideal. You know, ideally, you want to have many people at each coin join, so you don't have to keep coin joining every time, because you do have to pay a fee every time a transaction is done. Um, share? Any reason why that is? I think they probably did it so that you don't have to wait very long to get another person to uh, coin join with you. Uh, but I'm not totally sure, actually. Um, and share coin, uh, I know it's been kind of up and down, so I think it's back up again. I don't know if anybody from blockchain is here, but... It's still down, I think. It's still down? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know why they took it down, and I don't know what the problems were with it. Um, but uh, I, the, the one thing that's a little different, I'll talk a little bit about denominations, is with share coin, you don't have a fixed denomination. So... Um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, as, I get, as I go forward. But any other questions about how CoinJoin works? Does that make sense? Okay, so CoinShuffle um, is an advance, I think, on CoinJoin. Uh, other people may have different opinions. Um, it's funny, my current is actually one of the people who's not, not a huge fan of CoinJoin, but uh, I actually I, I have a higher opinion of it than you have. Um, but CoinShuffle was, was proposed by these three researchers, security researchers, in uh, Germany. And um, it's, it was actually just proposed earlier this year. And the idea is that, like I said, no central party needs to be trusted. Not only can the central party not steal your coins, they actually don't know who's, like, what inputs and outputs were mapped together. So uh, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty important advantage over, over CoinShuffle. So um, the way that Coin Shuffle works is that, uh, and actually, I guess there's been some discussion on the Bitcoin mailing list lately. So it's actually, you know, until about a week ago, I don't think very many people have heard of it, but they, they've just been posting quite a bit to the Bitcoin mailing list. Um, but the way that it works is, let's say we've got four people, um, these canonical uh, encryption, encryption folks. Um, and the way that it works is they start by broadcasting three pieces of information. And this information goes to everybody. So... They start by broadcasting uh, what's called an ephemeral, that they put in the paper called an ephemeral public key. This public key is only used for the purposes of this one coin shuffle. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that's used in a minute. Then their input address. So the input address is sent to the broadcast that everybody can check the input address to make sure that the inputs have enough um, coins in them to, to participate in the coin shuffle. And then finally, there's a denomination. So, uh, you know, for this case and for the demo, I'll use one BTC. I'm just using a, a testnet Bitcoin, and that. Um, and so all those people get together and they all say, "Hey, we want to do a, a coin shuffle for this denomination." One thing to notice: there's change and all these kinds of things. I'm not that. That all gets handled. Um, it'll, you'll see a little bit of it in the demo, but I'm not going to talk too much about how that works. Just assume the change is not that big of a problem. Uh, oh, one note is this is slightly different than the actual paper. Um, I implemented it using Node.js and WebSockets which sort of broadcast everything to everybody. So it's a little less efficient than the proposal in the paper, which is that uh, each person passes the information uh, to another person in turn. But uh, uh, it's for, all, for, all, for most purposes, it's, it works basically the same. Where are they announcing it? Sorry? Where are they announcing it? Oh, the paper, they actually announced the paper in uh, April. No, 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 I mean, where are they? Oh, okay. Was, so yeah, so in order to, uh, the way that I've implemented it, is the shufflers connect to a server via WebSockets. So they, they have an IP address um, of a server, and they uh, connect via WebSockets, and they broadcast that to the other... Uh, uh, the, the server actually puts them into a room, which is people all doing a shuffle for the same denomination. It's just a proxy. Yeah, basically it's a proxy, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I mean, we actually are working on uh, Marcel or who's going to come here later, explain later. So he's actually kind of working on a P2P way to do this. Uh, but for the purposes of the demo, I actually just have it connected to the server. So my server is devbtc.com. Um, so I'll show you guys what that looks like later. But, um, so, so what happens is each person that's going to participate in the shuffle, they, uh, so they've, they've already sent their inputs. We've already verified that the inputs have the coins and the amounts that, that they're supposed to. But we need to find a way to get the outputs to everybody in a secure way, so that nobody knows which outputs came from, from which input. Um, and the way that we do that is uh, by using what's called a layered encryption. Uh, and what happens is Alice, I don't know if you can read, but Alice uh, 
will take her output, uh, just an address, and she'll encrypt it with four layers of encryption. So Dave, Charlie, Bob, and Alice uh, will all, she'll, she'll use all those public keys, all those ephemeral public keys, and encrypt them all in order uh, so that uh, basically it's, it's um, obfuscated from, from anybody who might be watching. Uh, Bob does the same thing, Charlie does the same thing, Dave does the same thing, uh, and they all broadcast all of those to everybody. Then what happens is that um, those outputs get shuffled and decrypted. So what happens is Alice, so one thing that's important is the order needs to be uh, uh, set at the beginning. So the way that I've implemented it, it's a, it's a randomized order that gets set at the very beginning. That order is broadcast to everybody, uh, and then people encrypt using that order. So um, what Alice does is she randomly sort of shuffles these around. She can move like you know number one to number four, number two to number three, etc. And she then strips off her layer of encryption. So this pink layer of encryption goes away, and she then passes that off to Bob. Bob does the same thing. Uh, he shuffles again, and then passes his uh, strips his encryption off and passes it to Charlie. Does the same thing against Dave. And at the end of the day, everything comes to Dave. Um, and Dave has, he strips off his layer of encryption, and now he has four outputs, but he has no idea which order the output started out in. Um, you know, he will know his output, so he can say, oh, this is my output, but he has no idea which ones are Alice's, which ones are Charlie's, and which ones are Bob. So uh, that's, that's sort of like the, uh, the way that Point Shuffle handles this problem of not allowing any individual to see the entire mapping between inputs and outputs. They can each only see their own, you know, one slice of that. But imagine if you use, you know, 30, 40, 50 times. You have all these different participants. It's very, very difficult to, it's, I guess, uh, very, very difficult to, to link these outputs. Um, you basically have to sort of get everybody to collude uh, against one person, which uh, that's actually one of the attacks I'll talk a little bit about. But um, that's that's basically how it works. So once, once Dave has these four outputs, um, the facilitator, in this case, uh, the server, just generates an unsigned coin join transaction. Um, so, as you know, as, you know, we don't know whose outputs these are. Um, and then all of those, un that unsigned transaction gets passed to everybody, and each person reviews that transaction. Um, if it looks like their outputs and their change and all that stuff, I left off the chain, but they make sure that the change and everything is uh, as expected. And if it is, they, um, they sign that and the signed transaction gets passed back to the facilitator, who then will broadcast it onto the Bitcoin network and the transaction will take place. So, um, so that's how it works. So I'll do a little demo. Anybody have any questions about sort of the logical, yeah? Yeah, so in that example, we think about, about four different peers who are participating. Yeah. Does the paper, are you making a recommendation on the number of peers that's appropriate to sufficiently mix the transaction? Um, so the question is, does anybody, is there a recommendation of the number of peers? Um, the paper does not make a specific recommendation. They have a performance, they talk about a performance test they did with 50 peers. Um, and uh, so I think that that's actually one of the things I think should be configurable within the server or even within the client. So you should be able to say, you could be able to say something like, I am willing, I want to have like 50 people in my shuffle. I'm willing to wait, you know, an hour until 50 people get there. Uh, whereas some other people might say, I'm, I just kind of want to shuffle really quickly. I only want to wait for five people to show up. So I think that um, that actually it should really be configurable based on the person's need for um, privacy, let's say. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any more uh, mathematical uh, way to, to make sure it's, it's the right number. Yeah. yeah. When you get the final transaction, can you just... Uh, Re-encrypt using the federal public key figure out what the original compare the order. Ah, uh, no. So the reason that doesn't work. That's a good question. So the question is, could you just re-encrypt using the public keys to um, find the order? And um, you know, luckily, the way that uh, it works, at least the public key encryption, or I think most kinds of encryption, if you encrypt something more than once using the same key, you'll get a different ciphertext every single time. So uh, I forget the exact terminology. It's like uh, chosen ciphertext attacker. You know, it's like some there's some there's some uh, one of these guys probably knows. Taj uh, probably knows. Will keep in in the ECDSA signing process. Okay. Or will sign. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's just a nonce in there that remains secret? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you can't just re encrypt it to find the order. Um, any other questions? Yeah? So, um, what happens, and this is probably nothing else, but um, what happens if you end up with four outputs and the result? Like one of them's huge. Very good. So someone's yeah. Good question. Uh, exactly. exactly. So, there's actually, they wrote in the paper um, this blame process. And basically, what happens, uh, there's a couple ways that they do blame, and, and one of them, the more complex way, I actually haven't spent that much time to, to understand. But the obvious one, or the, the simplest way to resolve this is everybody, if, if they know that everything's broken, everybody just broadcasts their, um, uh, their, their uh, decryption keys. So then everybody takes the decryption keys, runs through the whole process, and they see who, who screwed it up. Then they, then they exclude that person. They exclude that input, and then they run the same process again. So. Uh, what's that? You then have to change your outputs after. Yes, you have to change your outputs in your ephemeral public okay. key. So if it breaks, you have to change your outputs in your ephemeral public key. Uh, so, DOS, you remember what you're saying? So, uh, yeah, so the DOS, there's a couple ways you can, so one of, the, one of the obvious attacks is, like, let's say you've got 10 people shuffling, and you have one legitimate shuffler, but then the NSA says, hey, I want to dump in, you know, you know, thousands of shuffle requests, and they isolate that, that one person. Um, what you can do is you can one of the things you can do is you can say for that specific for you can you can open the shuffle window for a specific period of time. Let's say five minutes, ten minutes, whatever you think will be necessary to get a sufficient number of legitimate shufflers. Um, and you can you can then see uh, so hopefully so as long as anybody can join, you know that there will at least be a few legitimate shufflers in there. A bigger problem might be hey like you open this window for five minutes, but you have like ten thousand you know shuffle requests. Um, one of the ways that that is mitigated is that you can check uh, the inputs. So it would actually be fairly expensive to do um, a bit like a mass DOS attack because each of those inputs actually has to have the coins in there. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, they would get excluded immediately. And so, and then you can also do kinds of things. you can. So that's that's one thing. You can also trace the coins that are being submitted for the shuffle, and you can say something like. Um, you know, these coins should only be shuffled, you know, once, you know, twice every 24 hours or something like that. So if somebody's just kind of constantly recycling the coins and putting them into shuffle after shuffle after shuffle, you can, you should be able to uh, determine who that is. So those are some of the kind of measures that you can use against somebody who, who is just trying to enter in tons and tons of shuffle requests. Because it's actually fairly expensive to enter a shuffle request. Uh, or at least you have to have a bunch of coins. Uh, who is it? Who is it that chooses the participants? Does Alice choose? Oh, so in this case, the server just accepts anybody who connects and who has a valid input is allowed to shuffle. And basically, the way I have it set up is in the demo, it's there's a threshold of ten shufflers. So it's first first ten shufflers, um, first ten shufflers get to get to participate. Um, there's probably a, there's a lot of other ways you can pick the shufflers. You can hash and use alphabetical ordering. Like I think it'd be, you could do a lot of more sophisticated things um, to make sure that to, to eliminate some of these DOS attacks and um, make sure there wasn't collusion and those kinds of things. Because um, Alice can certainly also be like Bob and Charlie at the same time. Right. So that's exactly yeah. So the thing is that's so the way I've set it up basically uh, as long as you know at least one other legitimate shuffler, let's say, and uh, or I mean there's so like the time window um, solution I was talking about. If, as long as you know that when you submit a shuffle request, it gets into the right time window, you can have a general sense that you know uh, there's not somebody's not trying to isolate somebody, or you know, all, all shuffles given within all, all requests made within a certain time frame get accepted. Um, that could be that's one way to know that uh, that Alice or the, let's say the server is not specifically trying to exclude uh, or trying to isolate somebody. But yeah, I mean that's a, it's fairly complicated. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that exactly. That's that's exactly right. So you can just put yourself you can yourself put in two requests, make sure they were both accepted. And you know, if you saw any weirdness like you know, one of your requests is accepted, the other one's not, and they both get isolated to different shuffles, then you'd be then you would say something's probably suspicious here. And and um, I know that's the problem. So, so you're 
That's true. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. So you could, um, yeah, that's uh, that is one of the nice things about about CoinJoin in general is um, just the fact that um, it sort of exists makes it makes gives you some some deniability. Uh, yeah. I'm sure I missed something in the presentation. So is it required that uh, every transaction has the same amount of Bitcoin? Uh, so yes. So that is that is true. So. Uh, at least the way that I've implemented it, I think this is how it's specified in the paper. Uh, the question is, do, do all the transactions have to be for the same amount of Bitcoin? Well, so, the following question is, um, how, so how do you get to the people that do exactly the same uh, transaction, exactly the same amount of money? Yeah. If I want to buy my iPad or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you guys are, yeah, you guys are, uh, I talked a little bit about this later on, but the, I think it's fine now. I, I only put like a bullet. But basically, uh, you, they're, they're, in the server that I've built, there's, there are two denominations. One Bitcoin and 0.1 Bitcoin, and what I envision, um, and I'm not totally sure if the authors of the paper uh, agree with this. I actually sent them, you know, we emailed back a little bit, but they never responded to this particular question, which is, um, uh, I see it as you shuffle on receipt. So let's say you get your paycheck, or let's say I get a payment from you, I will then put those coins. But the wallet will automatically put those coins into a series of shuffles that will shuffle your various denominations. So let's say I get, you know. Um, 2.75 uh, bitcoins. Basically, that that will uh, create a series of, of shuffles. Probably, uh, depending on the number of denominations the server allows, it can take you know three or four shuffles to get your your shuffle your coins into a shuffled state. And then for your next spend, you will uh, use those already shuffled coins. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of there's a few other nuances to that with like things like merge avoidance and that sort of stuff. But basically, the wallet should the wallet should be able to handle all that for you. Yeah. So really, this would be a could be a, you could set up a process to continually run. You're not just running it when I want to spend money. You can sort of shuffle not continuously, but periodically shuffle my coins so that they're pre shuffled pre shuffled before I want to use them. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's how I envision it happening. So the way I kind of envision it happening is you actually have a wallet that's kind of like a receiving wallet. So any any transaction that you receive. Uh, will go into this wallet, and the, the coin shuffle will happen. And when it's done shuffling, the outputs will go to uh, the wallets that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. So it might go to your phone, it might go to you know, just another wallet that you have on the computer. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how I think. That's my best um, sort of estimate for I think for, I think, for how I think it will work. Um, yeah. In terms of incenting participants, do you think of a marketplace in which? You you know participants in the shuffle have a shuffle fee that they that they'll uh, give out. Yeah, and that's a good question. Do um, you think that's realistic or? Um, well, I think that my initial take is that the shuffle fee I mean, there, will, there will be no shuffle fee. Like I mean, there's ideally there'd be as small a shuffle fee as possible. Um, I think that if more people have an understanding of Bitcoin privacy, maybe, I mean, maybe people in this kind of group probably know, understand these things, but I'd say the average person probably doesn't know uh, enough to, to do that. I think that um, they'll, they'll probably be like, why am I paying this extra fee to get my coins shuffled? Like, why is, you know, why does this not happen automatically? But I think that if people hear about situations where their coins, like basically what I envision is there's a button in your wallet that says, you know, uh, shuffle coins on receipt, and you pay, let's say, I mean, it's time, the fees are time, so let's say it's a dollar a year to get your coin shuffled. Um, because you know, let's say there's 50 people in each shuffle. There's only one fee that gets paid for that shuffle. So a lot of people can shuffle for a relatively small amount of, of money. The server could charge like an additional like 0.001 or whatever um, to just pay for server costs. Um, and so I think that initially, I just you know, ideally it would be free. But then um, at some point, I think that people would be willing to pay some small nominal amount to keep their coins in a shuffled state. That's that's my that's kind of my thinking. But, um, and then there's also also all kinds of things like you know no fee transactions and those kinds of things that you know if you're really not in a hurry, um, you might be able to do that kind of stuff too. Okay, any other questions? All right, so we'll talk a little bit about this demo that I built. Um, so this demo I'm not using as I said Node.js, WebSockets, uh, BitCore, and the SF Devs HD wallet. Um, I was actually not familiar really with any of these technologies before um, I built this. So when you guys go to the GitHub, 
Um, if you have any suggestions on the code style and those kind of things. I think the SF does head HD wall is maybe the hardest bit of code in there. It's really yeah, dense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's tough. Um, <laughs> definitely. Um, that was, that's definitely the, the, the diamond. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so let me uh, show you what these, these guys all look like. So the server, can, can people see this? Read this generally? Uh, the server is just, I just call it a coin shuffle monitor, and this monitors the coin shuffles that are going on. Um, there's also the wallet, which I will uh, soon enter the shuffle request. You'll notice, those of you who are familiar with the SFS Bitcoin wallet, um, there are these three tabs, um, and there's a new tab that I've added called Request Shuffle. Okay. Uh, we're actually not, not too hard. Um, code was, was relatively straightforward. So uh, you guys can see that on my GitHub also. Uh, and then the other thing that I've done is just to make this a better demo, I've created uh, this thing called Point Shuffle Simulator, which, uh, so in, for my shuffle, I'm just gonna have 10 participants, and one participant will be the wallet, and the other nine participants will be uh, uh, just random uh, sort of simulated wallets. And then uh, finally, I've also got BitPay's uh, inside running, so you can see, we'll be able to see the transactions after I've um, completed them. So, uh, let me just make this, make this happen. So, um, here's the monitor. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to uh, make a, uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the very beginning of the, the wallet, which is going to be familiar with the SFDMs, the wallets. You go here. You log in with your passphrase. Um, this is testnet. And so we'll create my wallet, uh, load some stats. So you can see I've got two, two point zero seven two bitcoins. Uh, I'll request a shuffle. And for this, for the purpose of this, I'll just send them to uh, let's say this address here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter this shuffle. So this, this, Shuffle, by the way, is not does not do what I was just talking about, where it, it shuffles automatically on receipt, because that actually makes for a not very good demo. Um, this is for uh, so this is if you are trying to do like an on-demand shuffle, you just want the shuffle to happen for this particular transaction. So I want I want to shuffle and I want the output to go to this uh, MTUHDD address. So I'll press request shuffle. Uh, oh, sorry, request shuffle here. So since successful. And now you'll see, I've, in the coin shuffle monitor, it's created a new shuffle. Uh, with this shuffle ID, 700, whatever, denomination 1BTC, and so forth.